Thank you very much. Apologies to members who I couldn't call, but we're going to move on to the next item of business, which is a statement from the First Minister on COVID-19. The First Minister will take questions at the end of her statement. I would encourage all members who wish to ask a question, please press your request to speak button. And I call on the First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I want to update Parliament on Cabinet's review of the current lockdown restrictions, which took place earlier today. I will report on some cautious grounds for optimism, I'm pleased to say, but also set out why it is vital in order to protect the NHS and save lives to stick with these restrictions for a further period. I will set out what that means for the timing of getting children back to school, which of course remains a priority for all of us. And finally, I'll touch on other aspects of our response to COVID, including control of borders, the further expansion of testing and the progress of the vaccination programme. Firstly, though, I'll give a brief summary of the latest statistics and then seek to put these in some context. The total number of positive cases that were reported yesterday was 1,165, which is 11.1 per cent of all tests carried out, and the total number of cases now stands at 164,927. I can also confirm that by 8.30 this morning, 284,582 people had received the first dose of vaccine, and I'll come back to the issue of vaccination and the progress of that programme later on in my statement. Uh, 1,989 people are now in hospital with COVID, which is an increase of 30 from yesterday, and 150 people are in intensive care, an increase of four from yesterday. I'm also very sorry to report that in the past 24 hours, a further 71 deaths have been registered of patients who first tested positive over the previous 28 days. The total number of deaths under this daily measurement is now 5,376. And once again, I send my deepest condolences to everyone who has lost a loved one in the course of the pandemic so far. Presiding officer, as these figures demonstrate, case numbers are still high. According to the most recent seven-day average, uh, they stand at more than 200 per 100,000 of the population. And the pressure on the National Health Service continues to be very severe. In short, we are still in a very precarious position. However, all of that said, we do see some signs for optimism in recent days. We believe that the lockdown restrictions and the sacrifices everyone continues to make are now beginning to have an impact. Case numbers which had been rising rapidly appear to have stabilised and even declined. In the week to 14th January, there was an average of around 1,900 confirmed new cases per day. That is an 18% reduction on the previous week. Test positivity has also declined slightly, as has the number of cases per 100,000 of the population. And while the new faster spreading variant is now the dominant one circulating in Scotland, the proportion of new cases with the S gene dropout that is indicative of this new variant appears to have stabilised at around two thirds of all new cases. All of this is encouraging and we think it is a signal that the lockdown restrictions are working even against uh, the faster spreading variant. However, it is important, first of all, to be cautious. We do need to see these trends continue to be more certain that this phase of the epidemic is now on a downward trajectory. And second, we need to be realistic that any improvement we are now seeing is down at this stage to the fact that we are staying at home and reducing our interactions. Any relaxation of lockdown, while case numbers, even although they might be declining, nevertheless remain very high, could quickly send the situation into reverse, uh, especially with the faster spreading uh, variant now being so dominant. That, of course, would further accelerate and intensify pressure on the National Health Service. As we have learned throughout this pandemic so far, the incubation period and the infectious path of the virus means that pressure on the NHS in numbers being hospitalised and requiring intensive care continues to increase for a period even after cases start to decline. And that pressure on the NHS is already acute. As of today, there are just under 2,000 COVID patients in our hospitals. Uh, this is around 30% more than at the peak of the first wave last April. And it means that around 80% of the NHS COVID surge capacity is already at this stage being utilised. 
The number of COVID patients in intensive care remains below the peak of the first wave. However, it has increased by more than 90 per cent since the turn of the year. In total, taking account of COVID and non-COVID patients, there are around 260 patients in intensive care beds across Scotland right now. And that compares to a normal ICU capacity of around 170. So the pressure the NHS is facing right now is real and severe. And it is, of course, having a significant consequential impact on non-COVID elective care. The number of new cases in the past couple of weeks also means that this pressure is almost certain to rise for a further period yet. All of that means we cannot afford to see the rate of infection start to rise again, which from such a high baseline, it could all too easily do if we start to interact more with each other than we are doing right now. So it is for all these reasons that the Cabinet decided this morning to maintain the restrictions which are currently in place. That means that the lockdown restrictions, including the strict stay-at-home requirement, will remain in place across mainland Scotland and some island communities until at least the middle of February. Cabinet will review the situation again on the 2nd of February. Now, there are two specific issues that I want to cover in a bit more detail. Uh, the first is a very specific local change that we decided this morning to make. Uh, there is currently a significant outbreak of COVID on the island of Barra, uh, part of the Western Isles. As of yesterday, there had been 39 confirmed positive cases and more than 10% of Barra's population had been required to self-isolate. There is a significant concern that without additional measures, the outbreak could spread more widely across the Western Isles. And there is also concern about the potential impact on care home and clinical services. For these reasons, the National Incident Management Team has recommended and the Cabinet, in consultation with the local authority and local health board, has decided that Barra and Vattersey, which of course is connected to Barra by Causeway, should move from level three to level four at midnight tonight. This means that the same lockdown restrictions already in place on mainland Scotland, including the stay at home except for essential purposes requirement, will apply there too. This change, which we will keep under review, applies only to Barra and Tizzy and not at this stage to the Western Isles more generally. And of course, all affected businesses, including hospitality and non-essential retail, which will require to close, will be eligible for business support. As the outbreak comes under control, which we hope will happen relatively soon, we will, of course, consider how quickly Barra and Vattersey can move back to level three. The second aspect of the restrictions that I want to talk about is, of course, of nationwide uh, and significant interest, and that relates to our schools and nurseries. School buildings and nurseries have been closed to most children since the start of the term, and we indicated previously that the earliest possible date for a full return to school premises was the 1st of February. It is, of course, a priority for all of us to get children back to normal schooling as soon as possible. I know how much work teachers, school leaders and other staff are doing to support home learning and I'm very grateful to them for that. But I also know just how challenging and stressful this situation is for families. And above all, I understand how difficult, distressing and damaging it is for children and young people to have their education and their normal interactions with friends so disrupted. However, a reluctant judgment at this stage is that community transmission of the virus is too high and is likely to remain so for the next period to allow a safe return to school on uh, the 1st of February. The Cabinet therefore decided today that except for vulnerable and key worker children, school and nursery premises will remain closed until mid-February. We will review the situation again on 2nd February and I hope we can set out then a firmer timetable for getting children back to school. I can say this today, if it is at all possible, as I very much hope it will be, to begin even a phased return to in-school learning in mid-February, we will do that. But I also have to be straight with families and say that it is simply too early to be sure about whether and to what extent this will be possible. However, I will update Parliament again as soon as we have completed the review, taking advice from our clinical advisers uh, on the 2nd of February. Presiding officer, while I don't imagine that anything I've said today will have been unexpected, that doesn't make it any less difficult for all of us, individuals and businesses, to be living with these restrictions for a further period. I continue to be very grateful to people across the country for their patience and resilience in the face of this extraordinary challenge. 
The fact is that for now, these restrictions remain necessary. Staying at home is essential to protect the NHS and save lives. However, important though the lockdown is at this stage, I know the damage it does. That is why the other aspects of our overall effort to control COVID and find a path back to greater normality are also vital. I want to touch briefly on three strands of that wider approach. Firstly, border control. Suppressing the virus within our own borders is our most immediate challenge. But as we do this, it is also important to reduce the risk of new cases coming into the country from elsewhere. And this is all the more essential as the virus mutates and new variants are emerging. The new variant that has emerged, for example, in Brazil and which is causing concern has already resulted in the four UK nations imposing a travel ban on a number of countries. And as a result of a more general concern about the importation of the virus, other new travel restrictions are also now in effect. All travel corridors have been suspended. This means that with some limited sectoral exceptions, everyone arriving in Scotland now has to isolate for 10 days, no matter what country they are coming here from. In addition, anyone travelling here must test negative for COVID no more than 72 hours before arrival. We will continue to assess what further restrictions might be needed and how they should be enforced so that we can manage this risk of importing new COVID cases as well as we possibly can. However, the strong advice, reinforced of course in law, is that no one should be travelling at all just now, either within Scotland or to and from the country, unless it is absolutely essential. Restricting travel continues to be a regrettable but vital part of our overall effort to control COVID and I must be clear that this is likely to remain so for some time yet. Secondly, we're continuing to expand the use of testing uh, within Scotland, including a more widespread use of asymptomatic testing. The Health Secretary announced on Friday the start of asymptomatic testing for all care at home workers. We're also further increasing our fleet of mobile testing units. These mobile units will soon be capable of serving up to 84 different communities at any one time. And we will shortly, in partnership with local authorities, set out plans for large-scale community testing of people without symptoms. And these will build on and take account of the learning from the pilots conducted before Christmas. All of these measures are important and will continue to be so in the months ahead. However, nothing is more important right now than the continued rollout of vaccines. The vaccination programme is progressing well and it is picking up pace. We are now vaccinating uh, approximately, indeed, more than 100,000 people a week. That number will increase progressively from here on and assuming we receive the supplies we expect to do, we are on track to be vaccinating 400,000 people a week uh, by the end of February. Now, the figures I'm about to give uh, to share a sense of progress so far, I must stress, are estimates based on management information. Official detailed statistics will continue to be published on a weekly basis, in addition to the overall figure we publish daily. However, as of today, I can report that more than 90% of care home residents, the top priority group, have now received their first dose of vaccine. Indeed, a number of health boards have now given the first dose of vaccine to 100% of their care home residents. In addition, more than 70% of care home staff have had their first dose of the vaccine and more than 70% of all frontline health and care workers have also received the first dose. We made a deliberate decision in line with JCVI advice to focus firstly on elderly care home residents because we know they have the greatest vulnerability to becoming ill and dying from this virus and we have uh, very painfully uh, seen that in reality over recent months. Uh, consequently, making sure this group benefits from the protection of the vaccine as quickly as possible is likely to have the biggest and most immediate impact on saving lives. However, vaccinating in care homes, for obvious reasons, is more time-consuming and labour-intensive than doing so in the community. And this is why overall figures are, at this stage, lower than in England, where more over 80s generally, but a lower proportion of care home residents, have so far received the vaccine. However, our pace of progress in the over 80s group is also now picking up. We estimate that between 15 and 20 per cent have already had the first dose and we are on track for all over 80s and everyone else in JCVI groups one and two to have been offered the first dose by the start of February. By the middle of February, we expect to have completed first doses for all over 70s and for all those who are deemed to be clinically extremely vulnerable. People in these groups will start to receive appointments for February in the coming days. 
We then aim to complete first doses for everyone who is over 65 by the start of March and to give first doses to everyone on the JCVI priority list by early May. Uh, that means, presiding officer, that in around three months' time, approximately three million people in total will have received at least the first dose of vaccine. This is, of course, the majority of our adult population and includes everyone over the age of 50 and many younger people with an underlying health condition. The rest of the adult population will follow after that just as quickly as supplies allow. I am well aware of how much interest, uh, understandable and uh, very legitimate interest there is in the vaccination programme. It is the biggest and undoubtedly the most significant logistical operation in Scotland's post-war history. Uh, the Scottish Government will provide Parliament and of course the public with regular detailed updates on progress. However, while there is no doubt that vaccines give us real hope for the future and they will help us significantly on the path back to greater normality, it is important at this stage to also add a note of perspective. The vaccination programme right across the UK is focusing initially and rightly on the advice of the JCVI on those who are most vulnerable. That means it is unlikely in the immediate future to have a significant impact on overall population-wide case numbers that we hope will come later. However, we do expect vaccination to have an earlier impact in reducing the burden of severe illness and death. And I'm sure everyone will agree just how important that will be. It is also the case, and this is my second point of perspective, that experts cannot yet tell us whether and to what extent the vaccines stop transmission of the virus. So we know it alleviates the burden of serious illness, which is extremely important, but we don't yet know if vaccine stops us getting and passing on the virus. And that means that certainly for now and possibly for some time to come, there will be a continued need for all of us to play our part in suppressing transmission in the ways we've been doing for the past few months. Obviously, I hope this will not entail the strictest form of lockdown for too much longer, but some mitigations, for example, physical distancing, hygiene, face coverings, possibly travel limitations, are likely to be necessary for some time yet. All of what I have just said is an essential part, I think, of being open and transparent with the public about the challenge we, in common with the rest of the UK and other countries, still face. But none of it should detract from the fact that we do now have hope, much more so than at any time since the start of this pandemic, of a path to much greater domestic normality, something that all of us crave. For now, progressing along that path requires continued discipline and continued sacrifice from all of us. Lockdown, including the stay-at-home requirement, however tough it is, and it is really tough, continues to be necessary. So please, I am asking everyone again to stick to the letter, uh, but also to the spirit of these lockdown rules. We should not be thinking in terms of the maximum interactions we can have without breaking the rules. Instead, all of us should be thinking every day right now about how we can reduce our interactions as far as we can to remove as many opportunities as possible for the virus to spread. So except for genuinely essential purposes, please continue to stay at home. Please, and this is vital, do not have people from other households in your house and do not go into theirs. Work from home whenever possible. And remember, if you are an employer, you have a legal duty to support your employees to work from home as far as possible and follow the facts advice at all times when you are out and about. This is how we best look after each other. It is how we can help our health and care workers manage the pressure they are currently facing and avoid adding to that pressure. And it is how we continue to slow down the virus while the vaccines get on with doing their work. I know it feels hard, uh, I know it is really hard, but I also know it is working. It is already saving lives. So please stick with it. Stay at home, protect the NHS, save lives. Thank you, First Minister. The First Minister will now take questions. Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Parents, pupils and teachers were all expecting today's news. Indeed, it was always pushing credibility to tell parents that schools would be closed until the 1st of February, reopened for a week and then shut again for the half term seven days later. And all he asked for is the government to be straight with them from the start. And parents, pupils and teachers will be concerned by the impact that this ongoing disruption will have on their children's education. But the way we get pupils back into school and get everyone back to some degree of normality is rolling out the vaccine as quickly as possible. 
Now, over the weekend, we saw the SNP's vaccine rollout lag behind their own targets. As of yesterday, the Scottish Government had taken receipt of 717,000 doses of the vaccine. More than 400,000 have yet to reach patients. Now, as the Scottish Conservatives called for, Scotland is rolling the vaccine out in care homes first. But that doesn't explain how slowly the vaccine is reaching GP surgeries and eventually the public. On Politics Scotland, Dr Andrew Buis, chairman of BMA Scotland and a GP himself, said the supply of vaccines so far has been quite patchy. And he was asked today, could GPs and could others work faster at getting those 700,000 into arms? And he said, absolutely. I mean, the workforce is there and that's why it's so incredibly frustrating when the patients want the vaccine. We are very keen to give it to our patients, but we just don't have the vaccine in our fridge. Now, there is every member here can attest to the fact that people across Scotland are anxious to know when they will be called. My mother is approaching 85 and lives in East Lothian. My father-in-law is 80 and officially shielding following a serious procedure in August. At this moment in time, neither of them has received any letter or form of correspondence regarding the vaccine. I am becoming increasingly frustrated at the limited information on when my 81-year-old housebound mother-in-law will receive her vaccine. She lives in EH2. My father, who's nearly 94 and in poor health and who lives at home with a live-in carer in your constituency, has not yet had a letter from his GP surgery. I am 84 and whilst in a shop last week I announced that it was my birthday and still awaiting the jab. That's nothing, said the shop owner. My mother's 93 and still awaiting hers. All of our inboxes will be the same. People aren't just anxious, they are concerned that they don't get left behind. So on their behalf, can I ask the First Minister for an explanation for the following? We know how many doses of vaccine have so far been delivered to Scotland. We know how many GP practices have agreed to take part in the process. The GPs know who their patients are and they know how to contact them. And the only thing that's missing is that for too many practices across Scotland, they have not yet actually received any supplies. So can the First Minister explain why that is, where the hold-up is in the system and what she's doing to unblock it? And secondly, last Wednesday, the Health Secretary said that the vaccine rollout would be seven days per week. But yesterday we saw reports that NHS Louisa Jordan was closed on Sunday and no vaccinations took place there. So can the First Minister confirm whether that is the case and with 400,000 doses sitting as yet undelivered, tell us when it will go to seven days? First Minister. On that last point, the NHS Louisa Jordan will be from now seven days. There was a particular issue on Sunday, I believe, with uh, pharmacy that meant it couldn't operate on Sunday, but it will be seven days uh, on Saturday. It was doing 5,000 vaccinations over the course of the day. It is expected to increase the number of vaccinations uh, it does. Let me take all of the points uh, that Ruth Davidson raised, or as many of them, um, as, as I can. Uh, and I set out in some detail uh, the strategy we have uh, followed in the early stage of the vaccination programme for very good and very important clinical reasons to protect those most quickly who are most vulnerable to becoming seriously ill and dying. So in Scotland, more than 90 per cent of care home residents uh, have been vaccinated, which is a higher percentage by some considerable distance uh, than the position uh, in England where comparisons are being made. We are now, of course, picking up pace with over 80s in the community. We are not behind our targets. Over January, we expected to be vaccinating in the region of 100,000 uh, per week. We are exceeding in the most recent week 100,000 per week. That is progressively increasing and we have set the targets, supplies permitting, of course, for that to reach 400,000 per week. We're all working to the same targets of completing uh, JCVI priority groups one and two uh, and then by mid-February one, two, three and four. Uh, the four nations may be going about that in a slightly different order, but we are all following uh, the same targets. On supplies, uh, and I want to be quite blunt and uh, perhaps brutally so here, uh, presiding officer, we last week uh, published detailed uh, estimates of supply now and well into the future. Uh, we put that out in a document that went on the web and was circulated. Uh, I hope I'm not about to use unparliamentary language, presiding officer, but the UK government had something of what I can only describe as a hissy fit um, about us doing that. So we agreed in consultation with them to take away uh, the publication of those supply figures. They don't want us to be open about supply for reasons of commercial confidentiality. And while I don't necessarily entirely agree with the reasoning behind that, we have agreed with their request. And yet what we have is the UK government briefing and spinning misleading figures on supply. So they have to be clear about which uh, approach they want us to take. Supplies are allocated to Scotland. They are then drawn down to Scotland 
and we vaccinate as quickly as we possibly can. And that will continue to be the case as we go through the different groups in our vaccination programme. Uh, Ruth Davidson read out uh, some e emails from people in the over 80s category that haven't yet been vaccinated. I've had emails from people in that position as well. I've also had lots of emails from people in the over 80s category who have had their vaccination. Uh, the entirety of the over 80s uh, will be vaccinated by the start of February. So by definition, there will still be some who have not had the vaccination uh, and teams around the country are working hard on that. So just let me recap uh, by the start of February, uh, not just all over 80s, uh, but all care home residents, all care home staff, uh, frontline health and care workers by mid-February, uh, the over 70s and those clinically extremely vulnerable. And that will not just be GP uh, surgeries that are doing that, but that will be community and mass vaccination centres as well. Uh, and then by the start of March, everybody in the over 65 age group. Um, and then by early May, everybody on that JCVI priority list, which includes uh, those of us and I hesitate to say that that does include me in the over 50 uh, age group and younger people with underlying health conditions. So this is the biggest priority the government has and we continue to make sure that the vaccination programme is rolled out as quickly, as effectively as possible. But I will not and never will apologise for prioritising the most vulnerable first. Yeah. Jackie Bailey. Can I thank the First Minister for an advanced copy of her statement? And whilst I welcome her cautious grounds for optimism, I think she equally acknowledged that we had some way to go. Critical to making progress is the rollout of the vaccination programme. And firstly, the Scottish Government's target is to vaccinate priority groups one and two by the first week in February. That's something like 560,000 people, with just about half done. Is the First Minister confident that she will meet that target by the 1st of February? And can she advise what specifically is being done to ramp up the programme to meet that target? Secondly, this, the, the BMA this morning were still reporting the patchy distribution of vaccines, and GPs are ready and desperate to start the vaccination programme. However, we hear that there are apparently 400,000 doses of the vaccine available in Scotland. If that's the case, then can the First Minister advise when they will be distributed to GPs so that they can proceed quickly to vaccinate those over 80? And lastly, can I welcome the involvement of the Army in helping with logistics of setting up 81 new vaccination centres? I think that is really positive news. But when does she expect these to be in place? First Minister. Uh, there are a number of centres already operational. Others will come on stream over the next period. It will not be uh, a case of them all coming on stream on the same day. And uh, we will, and, and have been all along, aligning the centres coming on stream with the supply of vaccine we have. I'm not going to repeat the points I made to Ruth Davison on uh, whether or not we can be open and transparent about the numbers of doses and the supply that we have and expect. I've, uh, we tried to do that last week. It didn't meet with everybody's approval, uh, but I'm very happy to republish what we published last week if the UK government are now willing uh, for us to do that. In terms of the doses that are in Scotland, uh, many of them have already been put into people's arms and the rest of them are uh, going to meet that target by the uh, start of February. I would remind people as well in terms of the uh, the allocation of doses that until relatively recently we had a JCVI advice to hold back 50% of doses to do the second dose within three weeks. Uh, so we had been holding back doses. They are now flowing uh, through the system because that advice has changed. Uh, yes, I am confident that we will meet uh, the early February target for the uh, groups one and two, which just to recap our uh, care home residents, which are almost all done already care home staff, frontline health and care staff and the over 80s group and it was always the intention to progressively increase that as supplies uh, increased and as the infrastructure uh, came on uh, stream and as I say we're already vaccinating at the rate of more than 100,000 a week uh, and then I'm confident supplies permitting that we'll meet the targets we have set after that. Um, the Army have been involved uh, to a greater or lesser extent depending on the phase we've been in with our pandemic response since the outset. They were uh, based in St Andrew's House for uh, a significant number of months uh, last year and I'm very grateful to them for their logistical support. They've given us support as they have other nations across the UK on PPE uh, supplies, chains, on uh, the 
early stages of the NHS Louisa Jordan and now some logistics support um, around the vaccination programme as well. But this is a programme that is involving people at all levels of government, the NHS, uh, many within the community uh, health services of our country. Um, and that's right and proper because it is the most important task that government has right now. Thank you. Patrick Harvey to be followed by Willie Rennie. Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Nobody will be happy about keeping schools closed to most pupils for longer, but nobody should be surprised either. We've been clear that full reopening can only happen when it's safe to do so. School staff, pupils and parents will want to know what additional measures the government is putting in place to ensure that it will be safe for everyone when the time comes. And while we are all, of course, eager to see the vaccine programme delivered quickly. The First Minister is clearly indicating that it won't mean life getting back to normal straight away. So if measures like social distancing will remain necessary, isn't it clear also that supported isolation remains a high priority over the weeks and months ahead on which both governments clearly need to make major improvements? First please. On schools, the most important thing we have to do to uh, get schools back safely is to uh, suppress the levels of community transmission. When we open schools in August, and it is uh, an achievement of teachers and other staff in schools that uh, they remained open from August right through to uh, the Christmas break. Uh, but we always said back then that a condition, a precondition of schools being open and remaining open was relatively low levels of community transmission. We don't have that right now, but over the next few weeks, I hope we will return to a situation that allows schools to open and then uh, we will continue as we have done uh, throughout this whole uh, pandemic to liaise with councils, with teachers, with individual uh, schools through the Education Recovery Group to make sure that all the appropriate mitigation steps are in place as well. Uh, as the vaccination programme rolls out, of course, both in this first uh, phase of the JCVI priority list, many teachers will be in these priority groups when we go into the rest of the population. Uh, I've said before, I hope that we can see teachers uh, in a, an early phase of that uh, next part of the programme uh, vaccinated as well. We are also uh, planning and we will uh, do this uh, on a, a test basis over the next uh, period, uh, looking both at uh, in-school lateral flow testing uh, and at home for uh, school uh, pupils and staff of PCR testing uh, to have a more widespread testing approach in schools when schools uh, do return. So there's a range of things that we're taking forward that are uh, intended to make sure that when schools get back, which I hope is uh, quickly, uh, although not as quickly I know as parents want it to be the case, then we have the ability to keep them open safely. Uh, on the uh, issue of even with the vaccine rolling out, uh, there being a requirement for some mitigations, I'm not saying anything that uh, other governments all over the world uh, will be saying too that as much we still have to understand about the impact of the vaccine on transmission, uh, it will absolutely, I am confident about this, it does uh, offer us a path back to greater normality, but for a period it may well be that we have to do other things as well, and I think it's important to be upfront about that. Continuing to self-isolate when we have the virus is one of those things, just as we have put in place the outreach service uh, through local authorities, the self-isolation support grant, which we've uh, already increased eligibility for and as I think I said last week looking again at how we further widen that we will continue to uh, take great care to do what we can to support people when they have the virus or are required to self-isolate because of it. Willie Rennie. Uh, last week the Health Secretary admitted that 200,000 doses of the vaccine were in storage in England this week we hear that could have doubled to 400,000. And I've heard today that GP practices in Fife are cancelling vaccine appointments because they've run out of the vaccine. Is the First Minister seriously saying that all the problems with the supply of vaccines into Scotland is to do with the production and not the government's distribution system? Is the First Minister going to admit that she's got a problem with distribution? First Minister. Uh, no, uh, I'm not. Uh, we have a big challenge, as all governments do, to make sure that as 
vaccine is allocated because there is a supply flow. We get uh, an allocation of doses. We then draw them down. They are transported to Scotland and then the doses in Scotland are, are distributed further and get uh, to the point where they are injected into people. So we have to keep that supply flowing. Um, I've already said why uh, we have agreed not to uh, talk in terms of numbers about supply, although I'm very happy to do that if there is a change of heart um, around that. Uh, of course, we have a, a restriction um, in terms of the use of the Pfizer vaccine in some settings uh, because of the particular logistical issues around Pfizer. Uh, so we are prioritising the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine for GP practices and using, we have been using Pfizer in care homes, uh, which of course are 90% done in terms of care home residents. So I, I don't underestimate, I you know, regularly as uh, recently as late uh, yesterday have very detailed uh, discussions with the, the Scottish Government official team uh, leading this work. Uh, I don't underestimate the ongoing challenges of this, but I, I don't think it would be right to say uh, that the programme is not progressing well. We have prioritised it in a particular way, and we will continue to increase the pace of it in line with the priorities and the targets that I have set out. Thank you. Annabel Ewing to be followed by Maurice Golden. Annabel Ewing. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As the MSP for Cowden Beath constituency, I know how vitally important equality of educational opportunity is for the life chances of young people. Can the First Minister therefore outline what Scottish, Scottish Government support has been put in place to support digital inclusion in Fife and across Scotland to ensure pupils are not losing out on their education? Thank you. First Minister. Uh, can I thank Annabel Ewing for raising um, a question of fundamental importance? And I think everybody agrees with that. It is such a, a regret, I think, to all of us that children are having another period of learning out of school and learning at home. And I know families and, and parents are struggling considerably with that. I've had a great deal of feedback in the last week or so uh, to the uh, effect, firstly, that the provision of online education is much better uh, than it was in the first lockdown, but nevertheless, that it is still a real struggle for uh, families to cope with the juggling of work and uh, looking after and schooling their children. Um, and it is really important that we recognise the, the, the impacts, the equality impacts of this um, and ensure that we try to level that as much as possible and in particular make sure that we are giving uh, younger people in more deprived areas greater access to online provision. Since the start of the pandemic, uh, we've invested £25 million to support digital inclusion, specifically among school-age children, supplying digital devices uh, across all local authorities, uh, benefiting around 70,000 children and young people. Uh, the Deputy First Minister announced uh, just last week an additional £45 million pounds of funding to assist with remote learning and Education Scotland has published information on entitlements for remote learning, uh, balancing live learning and independent activity, which will be regularly monitored. And their first overview report on remote learning is due uh, later this week. So these are issues we continue to treat with the utmost seriousness. Morris Golden to be followed by Bruce Crawford. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The extension of the lockdown will mean business support funding to protect jobs is more important than ever. Reports on the ground indicate councils are being overwhelmed trying to process business support payments, with SNP ministers having created a complicated and convoluted support system. So much so, SNP ministers are apparently considering outsourcing some schemes away from councils. Can the First Minister confirm if this is the case, and if so, which support payments will be outsourced? First Minister. Uh, what I can confirm is that we are exploring all options to make sure we get money to businesses as quickly as possible, something that the Conservatives have called upon us to do, and I think uh, rightly so. Uh, we have also previously, uh, and will continue to look at the support we give, the administrative support we give to local authorities uh, to help them uh, allocate uh, money as quickly as possible. Uh, we do have uh, quite a, a large number of funding streams for different sectors uh, and different uh, parts of the economy. That is in large part, and this is no criticism of anybody, I understand why, it's in large part due to the plethora of calls for different funding streams to be allocated to different parts of the economy. So we will also continue to look for opportunities to streamline that as we go forward, because it is really important that businesses get money as quickly as possible. Just, uh, 
This is uh, management information that was published earlier this week uh, that uh, between March, the start of the pandemic, and the beginning of October last week, uh, 383,000 business support uh, awards were made, totalling £2.3 billion. Um, and between October and December, an additional £60 million was paid out to businesses through uh, a variety of different schemes, and there will be further uh, allocation of money, including some of the uh, one-off top-ups for hospitality and leisure uh, paid at the end of January. So this is an ongoing priority and uh, one that we continue to give attention to, including uh, different ways in which we can improve the speed of money getting to where it is needed. Thank you. Bruce Crawford to be followed by Rhoda Grant. Uh, thank you, President Officer. First Minister, GPs in my Stirling constituency are receiving vaccine, some of them later than others, not entirely unexpected. But for maximum clarity for people watching from home, would the First Minister confirm that distribution of vaccine supplies to GP practices is coordinated by UK logistics company Movianto? Can the First Minister also confirm that it is the company that is responsible for vaccine delivery to thousands of sites across the UK including directly to GP practices in Scotland, not NHS boards. Finally, will the First Minister confirm that while the level of supplies will undoubtedly vary, people should be reassured the vaccine deployment is on schedule, despite the noise from the opposition to, to try to make it otherwise? First Minister. What it might be helpful to do, I'll ask the Health Secretary to do this um, in short order, is set out to MSPs exactly how the distribution process works, uh, because we, uh, Movianto is a, a key part of that, and GP practices will order uh, from the distributor, but of course health boards have uh, a big role in this as well, as does the Scottish Government in terms of coordination, but it would be useful if it hasn't been done already to set that out uh, for greater understanding. Uh, what we are absolutely, uh, at this stage, certain of, there are uh, is always uh, is always possible that there will be uh, interruptions to supply. Uh, so, but based on our expectations right now, we are confident of supplies that allow us to meet the targets that we have set and that I have reiterated today around the milestones that we will meet for the key JCVI groups, uh, with the over 80s, of course, being the first uh, after care homes um, in that order of priority to be completed at the start of February. But of course, we will keep uh, MSPs and the wider public up to date uh, with any supply issues uh, and any implications that they will have on the overall delivery programme. Thank you. Rhoda Grant, to be followed by Christine Graham. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I've been contacted by a constituent in Mull who told me that the slow vaccine rollout is causing alarm across the island. He told me that the vaccine will not arrive until the beginning of February, by which time the First Minister stated today that all over 80s elsewhere will have had their jabs. Now, the Cabinet Secretary for Health reassured the Parliament that there would be no postcode lottery with vaccines, especially in rural areas where there has been inadequate testing. Can the First Minister therefore reassure people over 80 and mum that they will have their vaccine before the beginning of February? First Minister. That, that is the date to do uh, all over 80s by that first uh, week in February, the start of February. I will look into the particular issues the member has raised about Mull and come back to it as soon as possible. Uh, I know that uh, certainly on the information I've been given uh, by the team uh, in the Scottish Government that actually some of our island communities uh, have had the fastest pace, perhaps because of the, the nature of the population groups that they are vaccinating. But um, I will look into any particular issues that might uh, exist around Mull and make sure I get an answer as soon as possible. Thank you, Christine Graham, to be followed by Jamie Green. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, First Minister, despite the actions of the majority observing the COVID rules, you described the situation as precarious and pressure on the NHS as severe. Yet on my brief walks, I see groups ignoring social distancing, a supermarket with no directional arrows, lack social distancing, even running out of hand sanitizer at the entrance. What more can be done to drive home to an offending, selfish minority the impact they're having on the rest of us and on lockdown? And what more can be done to get supermarkets to return to the COVID security measures of last March? First Minister. Um, so these are important issues. I think, firstly, I want to again uh, thank the majority of people who are, uh, and it's very, very difficult for everybody, uh, 
to do this, uh, abiding by these restrictions. If it wasn't the case that the majority were abiding by these restrictions, we wouldn't be seeing now these, albeit cautious, signs for optimism that I spoke about earlier on. Uh, but of course, we want to increase compliance as much as possible. Um, I will take away the point again about supermarkets. Uh, supermarkets have, uh, and I'm, I welcome this, uh, made a lot uh, of commitments in recent weeks about uh, strengthening some of their mitigations, including being much tougher around the wearing of face coverings. But it's important that all supermarkets do that, and we will continue to have a dialogue with them about that. Uh, to individuals, what I would say is um, I know, and I do know from personal experience, it can be very easy in the uh, spur of the moment to, to let your guard slip and, and forget a face covering or perhaps forget that you've got to be two metres distance. We've all got to just constantly remind ourselves of this. Um, and to people who perhaps think this is all um, you know, fake and that it's not something to be taken seriously, you're wrong. You are flatly wrong. And you, know, you only have to look at the numbers of people seriously ill in our intensive care units right now to know that, the people who are losing their lives, the bereaved families, the length and breadth of this country. So you, know, you are putting not just yourself at risk, you're putting others at risk. This is a time, more so perhaps than at any time in most of our lifetimes, that we are all so interdependent. Anything we do in flouting rules or deciding that they're not important doesn't just affect us, it potentially affects everybody around us, including people we love. So I would make an appeal to anybody who's in that category to please think again. This is serious, it is affecting many people very, very severely. And if we don't all abide by these restrictions, it gets worse, not better, and nobody wants to be in that position. Jamie Green to be followed by Maureen Wood. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Our schools do remain closed to the majority. The government has to ramp up efforts to prevent our most disadvantaged pupils fall further behind in their education. So can I ask the First Minister to shed some more light on what this phased reopening of schools might actually look like and what criteria will need to be met for ministers to give it the go-ahead to get these young people back into the classroom where they belong? First Minister. No, I can't give more detail on that right now because if I did I, I wouldn't be being straight with people about the uncertainties that still lie ahead. I will do that um, to the extent that it is possible to do that as soon as we've had the review on the 2nd of February. What I will say right now is that we will do everything we can to at the very least begin a phased return from mid-February. Clearly we have the uh, the mid-term break in February, the dates for that vary around the country. In terms of criteria, as I said, I think in response to Patrick Harvey, we need to get levels of community transmission much lower than they are right now. That is the most important thing. So the rest of us have a part to play in making sure that happens. And as I've said before, we mustn't, and I don't think anybody should see this as a binary schools open or schools closed. If it is possible to have young, and I'm simply saying this by way of illustration, not as an indication that this is a definite uh, decision, but if it is possible to have, for example, younger children back before older children, or parts of the country where transmission is lower back earlier than parts of the country where it remains higher, we will look at all of that. Uh, we want to get children, as many children as possible, back to in-school learning as quickly as we possibly can. But that must be safe, safe for children uh, and safe for those who work in our schools as well. Maureen Watt, to be followed by Ian Gray. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I've been receiving inquiries from NHS office support staff who believe that they could perform the majority of their work from home but are being denied or refused the chance to do so as a result of uh, lack of remote access tools such as laptops or supported VPN access. Given that working from home is a default position, can the First Minister say what guidance and support is being given to NHS boards with regards to the issue of home working for staff and what avenues are open to those who feel their concerns are not being addressed? First well, we're very clear that anyone who is able to work from home right now must do so. That's a statutory requirement, and uh, we are very clear that all employers, including the NHS, should be facilitating that whenever possible. Uh, obviously, and I think we all recognise that this, that given the nature of what the NHS does, that is not possible for everybody who works in the NHS, but it will be possible for some who work in the NHS, and where it is possible, it should be facilitated. Employers 
must make every effort and they must be flexible in their approach. Um, that must include considering individual circumstances and providing staff with relevant and uh, necessary equipment, IT services and infrastructure. Uh, the specific issues that Maureen Watt uh, has raised, if she wants to pass them uh, in more detail to the Health Secretary, I I'm sure she will look into them. And that will help us to assess whether there's more we can do to help NHS boards uh, help their staff work from home where that is possible. Uh, furthermore, we would expect staff to engage with their trade unions and employee directors should they have any concerns around this. Ian Gray to be followed by Emma Harper. Thank you. Um, I understand that the vaccination programme is following JCVI priorities, but 20 school hub staff in my constituency have contacted me. They uh, have to continue to work with vulnerable young people with complex needs up to the age of 17 or 18, and they point out that this requires providing care very similar to that provided by frontline care workers who have been prioritised for vaccination. Will the First Minister acknowledge that they may have a point uh, and reconsider the prioritisation of ASN workers in school hubs? First Minister. Um, I, I have already acknowledged this publicly. In fact, I discussed it directly with uh, Larry Flanagan of the EIS yesterday in the context of uh, one of my regular meetings with the STUC. This is not so much about reprioritising ASN staff who are in those circumstances. It is instead, and I've uh, undertaken to go back to the EIS with more detail of this as soon as we have uh, as soon as we're able to, but this is about treating certain ASN staff more as social care staff, given the nature of what they do. So I do recognise the point, and hopefully we will resolve that point to everybody's satisfaction soon. Emma Harper to be followed by Rachel Hamilton. Thank you, President Officer. I've been contacted by many constituents across the Fries and Galloway who supply co close contact services, like James Devlin, who's a driving instructor, and because they are newly self-employed, they cannot provide enough income information to meet criteria for business support previously available. While I welcome the Scottish Government announcement of the new Self-Employed Hardship Fund and the Mobile Close Contact Fund, I'm concerned about the time frame for the money going into constituents' bank accounts. Can the First Minister indicate when these funds will be available and how my constituents in g, &G can apply for them? First Minister. Well, as Emma Happer has indicated, we have set aside funding of £15 million for mobile close contact services uh, in particular and £15 million for a second iteration of the newly self-employed hardship fund uh, that we first introduced in April in order to uh, recognise and mitigate the financial challenges for those who weren't able to access the UK government's self-employed income support scheme. And we will provide more information on both of these funds over the course of the remainder of this month uh, in order that money starts to flow from them. Uh, the £30 million Local Authority Discretionary Fund is also empowering local authorities to direct funding to specific groups or sectors within their areas where they think there is a particular need that might not be catered for by some of the more general funds, and that includes uh, for supply chain businesses. So we will continue to uh, take into account of the point I said earlier on about building up a, a complexity of provision. We will continue to take account of particular needs, uh, even uh, in, in terms of some of the smaller parts of the economy, to make sure that we're getting funding to as many people as possible. Rachel Hamilton to be followed by Bob Doris. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It has been reported that of 700,000 doses, approximately 35,000 doses are expected to be wasted. Can I ask the First Minister what appropriate planning arrangement has the Scottish Government in place to ensure that hardworking GPs and their teams can know exactly how many COVID doses they will receive per week to manage and reduce that waste? And is there flexibility to use the projected 5% of vaccines that would otherwise be wasted to vaccinate other groups such as frontline police officers, as suggested by Callum Steele of the SPF, or indeed key workers? Okay, there is uh, quite a lot of, uh, if I may say so, misunderstanding in that question, which a even cursory reading of the deployment plan that we published last week would have cleared up. Um, so I recommend it to anybody who hasn't had the chance uh, to read it. You will find it no longer has the clarity on expected supplies because the UK government asked us to take those out of the document. But if they are happy now for us to put them back in, uh, that would answer part of uh, Rachel Hamilton's question. So perhaps the Conservatives who are uh, keen to know what the supplies are might want to make that case to their UK government colleagues. 
Um, on the, the point about wastage, and this is where I would recommend reading the deployment plan, uh, what it does for planning uh, purposes, and this is, as I understand it from my clinical advisors, an international uh, standard uh, in terms of planning for wastage, it makes an assumption uh, for planning purposes that up to 5% could be wasted. Now, that is taking account of the, what we hope will not happen, but what we have to plan for maybe happening, a, a freezer, a large scale freezer might fail or there might be some other large uh, unforeseen and unexpected problem uh, in the supply that means that that quantum could be wasted but that is not what we expect the wastage rate to be so we can't start allocating those to uh, other groups in fact the actual experience of wastage in the program so far is around one percent now that is uh, we try to get that down and will try to get that down as far as possible, but that will be spillages uh, or, or broken vials, the kind of things that will always happen. Uh, but we will try to get that uh, as minimal as possible uh, and nowhere near 5%. So uh, again, I would just recommend to everybody who might not have got round to it yet that these answers are all in the deployment uh, plan that we published last week. Bob Doris to be followed by Liz Smith. Does any officer of the recruitment of vaccinators deliver the various COVID vaccines is well underway and quite rightly focuses on recruiting registered healthcare professionals? A constituent of mine who is an airline pilot in foreign that in England, some pilots and cabin crew are now assisting as vaccinators following appropriate training. Can I ask the First Minister how the recruitment of vaccines in Scotland is progressing and whether there may be the need to widen out the recruitment to other groups of workers depending on the success of that recruitment campaign? Uh, the recruitment of uh, vaccinators is progressing well. I'm just looking for the specific number in my folder here. It's about the health secretary is telling me. I think it was 5,000. I think it's 7,000 have gone through uh, or are going through that uh, training. We have the numbers uh, currently active in the vaccinator uh, programme. Uh, that we need uh, to match the supplies of the vaccine we have and they will scale up as the supplies uh, scale up. We again in the plans, uh, the deployment plan that we set out last week, we uh, put in uh, their detail of the numbers of vaccinators that we will require when the programme is at peak, when uh, we are able to, to support that with the supplies. So that is going well, but of course uh, we want to, as we will do with all aspects of the programme, keep that under close and ongoing review. Liz Smith, to be followed by Stuart Millen. Uh, thank you. The First Minister will be very aware of the comments made by Scottish Care last week about the uh, concerns with the anti-vax movement targeting a lot of our uh, care homes. Could she update the Chamber on what action the Scottish Government is taking to counter this? First Minister. Well, I share the concerns of Scottish Care. We are putting in place a, a number um, of things, webinars, for example, with staff to address directly some of the concerns that they may have. Some concerns may be legitimate, others may be being fuelled by the, the anti-vax movement, which uh, uh, I think we have to be careful, doesn't uh, get allowed to, to cause damage to the programme here or in any other country. Um, I referred earlier on in another question to discussions with the STUC yesterday who made a very helpful offer to be part of that discussion with staff so that we can encourage uh, maximum uptake. Uh, I am, when I first heard about this, I was concerned, I'm still concerned, but the, the actual figures which I reported earlier on of uptake within the, the social care workforce give me some cause for reassurance, uh, as I said earlier on. In terms of care home staff, we are now at more than 70% of those who have been vaccinated with the first dose. And overall, in terms of NHS and uh, social care frontline staff, it is also above 70%. So that would suggest uh, that there is good uptake, positive uptake, but of course we want to get that as high as possible. And I think we've all got uh, a part to play in making sure that these ridiculous, uh, unfounded and baseless fears and smears that are spread around by the anti-vax movement do not get any purchase at all. Yeah. Thank you. I've got three further supplementaries. So I think we'll have time to squeeze them all in. Stuart McMillan to be followed by Neil Findlay. Stuart McMillan. Thanks very much, Fing Oster. The First Minister spoke earlier uh, regarding funding to assist businesses. Can the First Minister uh, therefore clarify whether the pet grooming businesses can access the support through the strategic business, uh, sorry, the strategic framework business fund, as by law they must remain open for essential services that, if not carried out, would negatively impact upon the animals' welfare. First Minister. Um, my apologies. It may be uh, my hearing uh, rather than a general problem, but I, I didn't 
catch all of Stuart uh, McMillan's question there. I think he was referring to pet services. Um, of course, our funding streams do take account of uh, the needs of businesses that are not legally required to close but are restricted in what they can do. Um, and that's important. But I will uh, make sure I get a, a more detailed answer. Perhaps if you can email my office later on just with the fine detail that I might have missed in his question, I'll make sure he gets a full answer as soon as possible. Neil Finlay, followed by John Scott. Uh, thanks. This week I was contacted by a senior consultant who advised that um, significant numbers of vaccine shots are being wasted in their uh, hospital because they have no standby system to use the excess that they have. And when they've raised this with management, they've been told in no uncertain terms that they should keep quiet about it. So this is not spillages or broken vials. This is excess vaccine that they want to use and put in the arms of patients. So can the government look very closely at having some sort of standby system where this vaccine can be used up? First Minister. Mm -hmm. uh, boards, as far as I understand it, do have standby uh, plans in place, but I will get the Health Secretary to follow that up just to make sure that they are all uh, working as they should do. No member of NHS staff, if they are experiencing something that is of a concern to them, should keep quiet about it. And I've always been very clear about that. Um, it is in nobody's interest. You know, it's, it's certainly not in the interest of the, the, the Scottish population, but you know, it's not in the interest of me or the government to have a single dose of this vaccine wasted in a way that is avoidable. There will always in a programme, a vaccination programme, be some unavoidable waste. We want to minimise that. But the suggestion that we would not take seriously any uh, reason why there may be uh, avoidable wastage it just doesn't make sense. So anybody who hears any of these things, uh, tell us straight away and we will get on to them and we will resolve it. It is really important for the smooth and efficient operation of the, the process that there is uh, plans in place for people perhaps not attending appointments for other things so that uh, doses of the vaccine are being used and being used to the maximum. And John Scott. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, that vaccination supplies reaching GPs in Ayrshire and elsewhere for the over 80s and the under 80s appears to be patchy is beyond dispute. Is there any particular reason or reason why delivery of vaccinations to GP surgeries has become such a postcode lottery? And what is the Scottish Government doing to resolve this? First Minister. Mm -hmm. The supply will. Uh, I mean, the, the word patchy has been used, which is not necessarily one I would uh, use myself, but the, the supply as uh, the supply, particularly of the AstraZeneca uh, vaccine, continues to increase. Uh, these things will, will even out. It's not a postcode lottery. It's about getting the supplies as quickly as possible uh, to GP surgeries. Uh, and of course, as I've said earlier on, there are logistical restrictions around the use of the Pfizer vaccine um, in GP surgeries. Uh, there are GP surgeries, uh, as we speak, will be vaccinating over 80s, uh, and that will continue to pick up pace. As I said earlier on, uh, probably getting towards 20% of the over 80s nationwide uh, have already had the first dose, uh, and that will increase progressively as we get towards that target of all over 80s by the start of February. Thank you very much. And that concludes our statement on COVID. Uh, we're going to move on to the next item of business. Could I just encourage all members as leaving the chamber just to use the aisles and gangways not to walk behind or in front of other members in their chairs? Thank you.